What is up, everyone? My name is Jared, and I am from TechWorks, and today we are talking about the two big dogs in the smartphone world right now. So we have, obviously, on the left, the iPhone 10, and on the right, we have the Pixel 2 XL Panda. So if anyone's been watching my other videos, you'll obviously know that my favorite phone has been the Pixel 2 XL. But I can't say that the iPhone 10 is a slouch either. It was probably actually one of the better phones that released this year and certainly one of the more innovative for a company that has been criticized for having its lack of innovation recently. So we're actually gonna talk about what phone is a clear winner. It's not gonna be a wishy-washy, uh, it's up to you sort of video. It's gonna be this one's better or this one's better and why. So there's gonna be a few categories, design, display, camera, overall experience, and we'll say intangibles, uh, Siri, Google Assistant, ecosystem. So with the iPhone 10, you have what a lot of people are doing now, the glass sandwich, as everyone calls it, and this one's the white one, so you have the nice, beautiful display going edge to edge, and you have, for the white one, you have the like stainless steel band around the outside, and then in the back you have the no branding, just the Apple logo, iPhone on the piece of glass. So the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus also did this design. Very similar, except it was the aluminum instead of the stainless on the side. And if you got the black version of this phone, the black rail was like a uh, dark gray stainless, I'd call it. They called it black stainless, but it was, it was like a dark gray. You have your two speaker rails on the bottom, lightning, your mute switch, and that's all you got. Um, Apple has a knack for making a premium device. When they make something, they may not be the first to do it, but I'll always say that they usually do it best when they get around to do it. So this phone did have wireless charging, has dual lenses, has uh, waterproofing just like it's modeled before it, and that's about that. So Pixel 2 XL now, the original Pixel had about down to here, a piece of glass up. It was a pretty plain, pretty simple design. I wouldn't say the Pixel 2 XL straight away much from that. You have this coated aluminum, coated metal on the bottom and on the sides, and you have the piece of glass on top. What I will say is that the iPhone, I would say is the more elegant design, and the Pixel would be the more utilitarian design, more functional design. And I say that because the glass back on the iPhone 10, which everyone had made a big stink about when it came out, can crack. This iPhone 10 to replace the back costs a lot of money. Aluminum obviously doesn't crack and it can take up a few more hits than this would. Uh, now the black, all black version of the Pixel 2 XL was as it says, all black. So you have black on top, black on bottom, black sides, black buttons, black front. I like the Panda just because it was different, it was limited, and it just was more attractive all around for me, and I really like the orange accent button on the side of it. I will say that I didn't, I like the texture, it's a smooth like silk texture. If anyone ever had the One Plus One silky white, that's exactly what it feels like to me. They also added that coating to the fingerprint reader. And the only reason why I say that's an issue is uh, I watched a video from Jerry Rig Everything and he showed that with enough damage, the coating comes off and it can interfere with the functionality of your fingerprint reader. On the front, you have your less than bezel list. I mean, it is certainly more than last year's, but you have a big bezel and my wallpaper's dark, but you have a larger bezel down here. And compared to like Samsung's and even the iPhone with the notch, uh, there's more black space on the screen. However, it has dual front facing speakers. So there's that. And they do sound pretty nice and they do get pretty loud. So looking at both of the designs, for the phones that are in, I would say, the same neighborhood of pricing, the iPhone is certainly more expensive, but in the same neighborhood of pricing, the iPhone takes it for me. And the only reason I say that is because they're both damn close to $1,000 phones. And as much as I do like the design and the color choices that Google had, this one feels more, more for your money. It's a heavier device. It's a thicker device, which not that thicker is good, but it just feels, it's got the weight to it. So I'll give that category to Apple. The next we're going to talk about displays. So 
in the in the Apple world, they did their first OLED bezel-less display with a notch in the top with Face ID. So Apple got their displays from Samsung. And so with that said, anyone who has had Samsung devices in the past knows that Samsung does make some pretty killer displays. The colors are great, they're nice and punchy, they're accurate. There's really not a bad thing to say about the iPhone 10 display without talking about the notch. So the notch is kind of controversial for a couple of reasons. So the way Apple did it, so you have their two sides left and right, you have your clock, which you bring down for your notification shade, and on the right you have your control center. Very similar to what Android does, when you go over here, and you unlock your phone, you pull down and you get your notifications. They've been doing that for a long time, Apple joined the party. The notch gave Apple room to put their Face ID cameras, their front facing speak or front facing camera, and their uh, everything they need to scan your face. So for me, I really didn't care about the notch. It doesn't necessarily bother me when you go into a lot of apps. It does utilize that space. Go into your email app. It just puts your just your icons up there. You know, you don't have icons like on Android where it brings up your like, email, your uh, photos, your Twitch, whatever. You just get your normal clock and your cell service uh, Wi-Fi indicator and battery. The iPhone screen, just screen alone, is great. You almost, when you look at it, maybe not through the camera, but when you almost look at it, it looks as if the icons are floating over the screen, which is really, it's a really nice effect, especially if you got a nice punchy wallpaper. It makes for a really good looking phone, a good looking display. So the Pixel 2 XL, the only problem that Google had, I would say, is all the problems they had in the media about the 2XL. Not so much the normal Pixel, but the two, two different manufacturers made the two phones. Um, the HTC was the smaller, LG was the larger. So LG uses also an OLED screen. This is obviously a little bit larger. Doesn't have the notch, has the rounded corners. But people were complaining about not punchy enough colors, a blue shift when looking off angle, and all around just a poor performing screen when comparing it to something from Samsung, whether it be the Samsung screen in the iPhone 10 or the Samsung screens that they have in their own flagship devices. So not that LG's was bad, everything looked good and they actually, Google ended up issuing a software update that gave it a saturated color mode, which is what I have it on right now, which does get it close to being as good as a Samsung display is on, say, their Note line of phones. So again, I have to give it to the iPhone for having the better display that didn't have the display issues off the bat. I believe my third category that I said I was gonna talk about was going to be camera. So iPhones always take very good photos, and ever since the 8s came out with their dual lens setup, they have the telephoto and their normal lens, which gives you the bokeh effect. And with the iPhone 10 and iOS 11, they came out with portrait lighting. So the iPhone 10 has the portrait lighting, which is supposed to, when you take a portrait, be able to uh, change the effect of lighting. Like studio lighting creates a black haze around you. And if I had enough samples, I would show you. Unfortunately, I don't. What I can say is, is that the bokeh effect in the iPhone gets it pretty good and portrait lighting is still in beta so there is still hope for it to get better but what happens a lot if you're taking a picture of say a woman's hair it gets confused with the hair and it won't include it or it will include it and it'll cut off part of her face and you know darken it for whatever reason and it's it's working on it but the bokeh effect usually does a pretty good job now you also have portrait on the front camera which again does a pretty good job it does a lot better than most phones I will say, when I first got this phone back in November, I went on vacation and took some of the best photos I've ever taken with a smartphone with this very phone. Great colors, great color replication, so the colors that you pick and you photograph end up looking the same as you photograph. It's not overly saturated like I'd say some of Samsung photos are, it's also not overly light, which I'd say like an LG phone would do. It, it creates a nice middle ground in the camera if you were reading the benchmarks, ranked very high. So they've always improved. Apple did get better with this camera, and I believe once portrait lighting gets out of beta, it'll even be better yet. But let's talk about the Pixel 2. 
Pixel 2 is unique in the way that it only has one lens on the back. It's a 12 megapixel shooter with your flash, and you also have just one camera on the front, which I believe is 8 megapixel, and that's it. The magic of Google's camera comes from its software. So where Apple had the two lenses to do the bokeh, all of Google's does it with AI and software. So what that actually means is the more people are taking bokeh pictures, and the more you take bokeh pictures, Google's gonna keep learning that software's gonna keep getting better, and your photos are gonna keep getting better. And this phone is one of those phones where you can take it out of your pocket real fast, double tap to get into your camera, take a photo, and it's gonna look great. You might get a couple that are motion blurred, but overall, it's gonna be a great photo. I really haven't had a bad photo from this phone. It has amazing detail, whether it be low light or perfect light. You know, you can do some great landscapes. The bokeh effect is near perfect. And I say near perfect because really, unless you're using a very professional camera um, with software or just two lenses, it's not gonna be like a professional photographer. But with that said, Google's gets, I would say, damn close to the best I've ever seen when it comes to bokeh effect and photos in general. And they do this all with one lens, which leads me to believe that phone manufacturers like Apple, like Samsung, that are using this two lens setup could learn a thing or two from Google and their software, which is making this one lens so powerful that it can outperform almost everything and almost some professional cameras in some very basic shoots. With that said, it's a hands down victory for the Pixel 2 or the normal Pixel. They both had the same lens setup. So with that said, quickly, the Pixel 2 and the Pixel 2 XL, only difference is the screen and battery size. Outside of that, identical cameras, identical hardware and software. So as it stands, we got two victories for the Apple and we got one victory for the Pixel 2 XL. So coming up next, we are gonna talk about user experience. So user experience is everything from when you turn on your phone, open it up, unlock it, do your day-to-day -day stuff, and be done with it. How easy is it for people to use their device? So again, with the uh, iPhone 10, you have no home button. They started going with this gestures versus their home button, and that's fine. It is definitely a new way to learn how to use your phone. So using it right off the bat, you set up Face ID, and Face ID works very quickly. It's obviously a lot more secure than, um, say, facial recognition in Android is right now. And another manufacturer hasn't really released a competent rendition of what Face ID has done, and that's definitely a win in Apple Corner, being first to market with software or innovation like that, I should say. But with that, you have now gestures. So getting to what you have to do now is different. So say you, I use the Google News app all the time, you go here, instead of going home with your home button, you have to swipe up. It's fine, it has a nice nifty little animation, you know, you kind of shrink it up and it just goes away and poof. But, say you want to go back. So you used to be able to double tap, go back to your last app. Now you can quickly just swipe on this little bottom section of your screen and you go through your apps. To get to your multitasking, instead of, I believe it was uh, double clicking or, or whatever the old gesture used to be, you go up, whoop. You go up and kind of, I go up and diagonal. The The way Apple says you have to do it is up and hold, but it's actually quicker if you go up and over. Don't know why, it just is. Uh, and that's how you multitask, and they actually kind of frown on you getting rid of your tabs. So what you have to do for that is you have to hold and tap the minus sign to get rid of all your running apps. iOS 11 has obviously introduced some improvements Definitely, it always is getting faster. The performance of the phone is blazing fast with their new Bionic chip. I believe this phone has three gigs of RAM, which compared to phones, say, like the OnePlus, which has some crazy eight gig of RAM shenanigans, this phone does just fine. Um, the user experience of the iPhone 10 is great once you get over the hurdles of learning gestures. Outside of that, it's just like any other day in iPhone world. You, know, you have your control center which I personally like that is up in the top because I am an Android user and that is where I'm used to having my toggles having it on the bottom for me and the old iPhones just seemed awkward I'm sure a lot of people don't think so but that's just me and the one thing I will say is notifications for me um, 
I like the way Android does it better. That's personal. So going over to the Pixel 2, Google obviously is the creator of Android. So with that said, they have the best version, you could say, of Android, meaning that it's clean. You get the phone, there's a few apps on it. Obviously, Google's core services, uh, Google Photos, Gmail, Drive, all that stuff, Maps, Play Store is on there. You have Google Calendar, you have their Android messages, and their phone app. Their phone app is nice this time around, or at least lately, because it has automatic spam detection, caller ID, which it pulls from nearby places. You can go into your phone, uh, put in pizza, and in a few seconds, you'll get the pizza places around. It's a nice, convenient feature. Other than that, you know, there's really... Google went for a simple view on this phone. What I mean by simple is, I'll use a comparison. Samsung always loads a shitload of features in their phone. And what I mean by that is they have the iris scanning, they have face detection, they have look away, and your video will stop technology, all that stuff, they just cram it in. Google went for something different in the sense that all their stuff, which is almost a play out of the Apple playbook, works and works well. So the one feature that they will have over their competitors is a squeeze for Google Assistant. They do have Google Assistant. You know, um, a lot of flagship phones in the Android world this year use the same setup, Android 835, uh, four gigs or more of RAM, and the 18 by nine widescreen aspect ratio is pretty much the norm for many manufacturers. Outside of that, you do get the latest updates. So again, similar to Apple, when Apple pushes out an update in a day or two, every iPhone will get it. When Google pushes out a security bulletin every month, the Pixels get it first. So if you're a Samsung user, you've probably always had the conversation of, you know, I am uh, OS behind and uh, others <laughs> I've already released with it and yet my phone is brand new and I'm already behind. It takes so long, blah, blah, blah. Google's not gonna be like that. You get your updates in a day or two. When Android P comes out, you'll get the new one. And Google promised three years of software updates for this phone. What I will say is with Android, you do have normal Android bugs and issues and things of that nature, albeit much less compared to many manufacturers, but you still have them. I will say that connecting the Bluetooth, like using Apple's accessories with the iPhone, it comes up with a nice little animation really nice and easy and the only one that I've really seen that works with the pixel like that is the pixel buds which are their own version of the wireless headphones for me I think they're both as good I think from coming from a lot of Android phones the pixel 2 really blows it out of the water with the user experience but I will have to say that overall a more polished experience is gonna be from the iPhone. And the only reason that is, is every iPhone is running the same software everywhere. And with Android, you get a whole lot of variations. Apps are made for years worth of Android versions to be compatible. So you have a lot of apps that haven't made it up for that 16 by nine. You have a lot of apps that are optimized properly. Not that that's Google's fault as an ecosystem problem, but I will say the overall experience is certainly easier on the iPhone. So next up is gonna be performance. And now I know I just talked about user experience, how it feels to use it, but how about performance? How quickly is it gonna open and close and do its things that you have to do? Apple released their A11 Bionic, Google has their Snapdragon 835, which again, a lot of other manufacturers used. The Pixel is nice and quick to unlock. You have your fingerprint reader where it should be. Everything is right there. Opens up really nice, slow animations. Everything looks nice and fluid. Little to no hiccups. iPhone, you have the Face ID, which has its own issues. But once you're in, everything is, again, nice and speedy, nice and fast, and you don't have a problem there. I will say it seems that the Pixel opens things quicker just for the fact I believe the animations are slower. So if you ran a benchmark score, this phone would 
smoke any other Android phone because of its multi-core score. However, it's not all about benchmarks. And I would say even just opening a few quick apps, we'll do the classic, we'll close everything out, shenanigans that we normally do, we'll close everything out, it's going to be darn close. So, for example, we'll go to our messages, we'll go to our browser, we'll go to our app stores, and we'll go to our calendar, wherever my calendar is at. So, if you look back, I'm sure there's going to be some that the Pixel did better, some that the iPhone did better. People are going to give me the, the question of, oh, well, you know, you didn't use the same apps for everything. Yeah, I know. Well, you're not going to use the Apple Calendar on the Pixel, all right? And I'm not going to use apps that are just solely optimized for iOS when I'm trying to compare it to Android either. So I'll use their native apps and see where it works. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to give it a tie. And why I give it a tie is Android has came a long way. Apple, however, I can say consistently has had a good performance on their phones, but in some cases, the Android will beat it. In some cases, the iPhone will beat it. I can't say definitively what one is gonna be better than the other. So next and last category is gonna be intangibles. And what I mean by that is, you know, uh, assistance, ecosystem, extras, um, little added, added value to the phone. So again, you have Face ID, which is the most secure, Apple says form of identification they've ever had which I will believe it because it's your face and I know people have fooled it with silicone masks and all this other crazy stuff but how long did it take for them to fool face ID a very long time and you have of course the benefit of the Apple ecosystem your iPad your Mac your AirPod now the HomePod Apple TV all that stuff Apple music and Siri which can be hit or miss for a lot of people. Myself, I'm not very invested in the Apple ecosystem. I don't have a Mac. I don't have um, a lot of other Apple products. I do have an Apple TV, which I don't use. I don't want to get a HomePod because of the limitations it provides. And Macs, at this point, the only Mac that I'd probably get would be the iMac Pro due to its power for creative purposes. Everything else I feel, in my opinion, is just too expensive. With that though, people are very heavily invested. If you have an Apple Watch, it works great with. AirPods sync immediately. You can aircast to your um, Apple TV. You can airdrop to your Apple computers. Everything works really well. You have Lightning, which is proprietary to Apple. But again, if you're very invested in that ecosystem, you'll probably have a dozen different Lightning connectors lying around your house. Now Siri is gonna be a sore subject. So Siri, I would say is certainly less useful than Google Assistant. And I say that because it's less conversational, it can't do a lot of simple things that the Google Assistant can do, and I'd say it's still very behind both Amazon Alexa and Google Assistant. Maybe they're maybe Siri is beaten Bixby, but I wouldn't really be too proud of that. So with that, the new HomePod, a great example, only can use Siri, and it's certainly lacking in comparison. Google Assistant, you can basically do everything. You can do everything that controls your phone. You can do anything that with your house, like I have a Nest thermostat, I can yell at Google Assistant to turn my heat up, turn it down, turn my AC on. Yes, you have HomeKit with Siri and it only works with a certain amount of things. So most of the time, Google Assistant is gonna blow Siri out of the water and in almost every test it does. Google's downside is it doesn't have the uh, well-built ecosystem Apple does. They've been building it for years, it works great. Apple Watch, all that stuff, Apple Watch would say is the best wearable that you could buy in any Android watch comparison. They just don't really compare to how Apple did their watch. On the other hand, Google, on their phone, they have the squeeze feature for Google Assistant, which is actually pretty convenient because it's not something that you really accidentally hit. Uh, Bixby, you hit by mistake. Google Assistant, when you squeeze it, you can either squeeze or just hold your finger on the home button and get your Google Assistant. Now, Google obviously has its own ecosystem, and a lot of apps on iPhone I still use are Google's, like Google Photos, the Google app, Google Home, and Drive, Gmail, 
YouTube, all of that stuff. Obviously the Pixel has all of that built in and has great functionality with all those apps built in right from the start. So my photos immediately go to Google Photos. Uh, I obviously use YouTube Studio and YouTube, all that's right there. Google owns Nest, so all my Nest products work very well with the Android operating system. You have the quick shortcuts for everything, which I know you do have the uh, the 3D touch capable apps on iOS, and I, I'll show you, you do have, you don't have any quick settings on the Nest app, all right? So that's, for me, the Nest app is more functional on Google because it's just more tightly integrated. But something different is many apps, say like my Chevy app, they offer the same functionality. But I would say I am more invested in the Google ecosystem, and a lot of people are. Corporate email addresses, a lot of them are Gmails now. And Google's just involved in a lot of everything as my Google Home goes off. Um, I have three Google Homes in my house because they are good speakers. They provide Google Assistant, which is a great assistant. And to be honest, they are a lot cheaper than Apple's HomePod right now. So really, I would say that for intangibles, for things that you could do, obviously you have the functionality of the Pixel, you can use with a lot of other stuff besides Apple products. You can use you know, your Pixel with your Mac. You can use it with a lot of other stuff. You could use it with Samsung smartwatches. You can use it, you know, you have Android Audio in your car. A lot of things like that obviously work very well. Apple is very restrictive in the sense that most of the time it works best with Apple products. And I will say that not having the option for the fingerprint scanner, I would have at least had put it in the power button, was a hard nut for a lot of people to swallow getting used to this Face ID feature. Face ID doesn't always work great. It works, I'd say maybe 75% of the time. If it's really dark, it's not gonna work. Um, I've had it where my hair is really disheveled and it doesn't work. And when I had my glasses, it took a while and then it finally would start to work again. And it learned that, oh geez, he wears glasses too. Having the option for the fingerprint sensor, as I take my phone out of my pocket, just put my finger right there, bam, my phone's unlocked. Having a squeeze away from Google Assistant is really nice compared to having to hold the power side button to get to Siri. I've accidentally hit the power and side button in the movies the other day and it just went off. So it's, to me, I'd say the ecosystem that Google is involved in may be less uh, specific to a lot of people, but I would say most people are involved in Google in one way or another. And I'd say with the Apple ecosystem, you're really either in or you're out. There isn't much in between. So for that, I'm gonna give intangibles, the Google Photos, the storage, your backup of your photos, the great updates, all of that, I'm giving it to the Pixel 2 XL. So if anyone's counting, you're at three and two. And those are all my categories. So even though everyone that has watched my videos will obviously know I love the Pixel 2. I use it every day. It is certainly my go-to. I'm still gonna say that the iPhone 10 categorically is the better phone. It's definitely better for people that have heavy investment in Apple. I'd say it was more boundary pushing with its face ID, its screen design, things of that nature. The screen is certainly better. I'd say the design is more worth the money than the Pixels is. Not that it's bad, but it's just more worth the money. You spent the money a lot for the iPhone 10. You wanna kind of feel it. And being real close to that with the Pixel, I feel the same sort of quality from the $500 OnePlus as I do the Pixel. It's just kind of calling it as I see it here. So with that, I will definitely say the iPhone takes it in the categories. Now, there will be plenty of people who are gonna be one-sided, one versus the other. You know, I hope that I did the both phones justice in trying to lay out their strengths and weaknesses, um, both camera, display. Really, if the Pixel did something a little more crazy with this design and didn't have its screen flaws, it may have won or it may have tied. Maybe next year for the Pixel 3. Because I guess from all things considered, Apple will probably be using this design philosophy for a very long time now. So with that, there it is. 
Uh, leave your comments down below. Let me know if you agree, disagree, if I forgot anything, if I didn't, uh, what you think, if there's another category I should have talked about. Leave it below. I know this was a long video, 30 minutes long. That's a whole lot of time. Uh, anyway, thank you for watching. If you watched to the end, I really appreciate it. I am Jared from TechWorks, and I will see you again in the next video.